state. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> We're all set up. Um, I just wanted to thank Peter um, for that introduction and also thank Peter, Susan, Dina, and Jonathan. I'm just super thrilled to be working at the Codex Foundation. Um, I also wanted to reiterate the thank yous to volunteer coordinator Amelia Grounds and all of the volunteers. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty small staff, so I don't know what we would do with all the volunteers. It's a huge help. Um, I'm so glad to be here uh, in person with you all. It has been and continues to be a really rough couple of years. It's difficult to refrain from embracing many of you that I haven't seen for so long, um, but it seems we'll still have to do air hugs and elbow taps and fist bumps for a while. There's a few hugs that sneak in there. <laughs> um, as for politics, too, I have to mention the fight continues. I'm sure you are all with me when I say my heart goes out to the people in Ukraine and in other places across the globe where people are suffering. We are very fortunate indeed to be able to do the work that we do. And I hope you never doubt the importance of the arts within culture, especially during times of war and upheaval. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Before recently moving to Berkeley, I lived in Reno, Nevada for seven years, just a three-hour drive from here and a quick hop over the Sierra Nevada mountain range. I was reintroduced to the desert, the blue sky, and the blue, blue waters of Lake Tahoe. On moving there, I read John McPhee's Basin and Range, a lyrical contemplation of the science of geology in that area, as well as Bill Fox's The Void, The Grid, and The Sign, who you'll also hear speak later this morning. Along with Rebecca Solnit's Field Guide to Getting Lost, these books, along with the vast landscape, were some of the primary fuel I used for the seven years I was working there. I am thrilled to be able to share some of this work with you now that all revolves around these themes of the book as a geological artifact, and words as rocks. Starting off here with two sketchbooks that are one of a kind, the jumping off point for some of the larger edition projects to come, these were the first works I made after moving to Reno. In them, I began to think about language and the land, in particular, words and rocks, how letters and words crystallize in an effort to capture and express the essence of things, and the ineffable nature of our experiences. Language, of course, is one of the best tools we have. However, language can also be pretty shifty. <laughs> On the one hand, words can be quite utilitarian and to the point, like the words from a dictionary definition. But words, of course, can also be used me metaphorically, poetically, and stunning, be stunningly complex. And in another breath, words can be weaponized, hateful, manipulative and abusive, and everything in between. This first book is called Words and Rocks. It is sometimes as if the words flow into us, malleable, fluid, pliable, full of growth and potential, but at a certain point they begin to calcify and harden there, to define us and to confine us, and more dangerously, to define and confine others, locking us into our own definitions. The second one of a kind book is titled Deposits. It took to heart a quote from John McPhee's Basin and Range, where he talks about the highly descriptive and metaphor laden science that is geology. Speaking of geology, he says, it was a foundation of metaphor, of isostatic adjustments and degraded channels, of angular unconformities and shifting divides, of rootless mountains and bitter lakes. It goes on and on, uh, but he continues by stating that as years went by, such verbal deposits would thicken. This last phrase and the images it evokes of verbal deposits stuck with me for some time, as you will see. 
In this book, I wrote random memories that I felt had embedded themselves deeply in my own body, for better or worse, like a layer of strata in my very tissues, or pebbles wedged in the layers of my muscles and tendons. These two little sketchbooks are about six by four or five inches. Each were the jumping off points for the book projects to come. So the next project continued in this vein and was influenced by one of America's earliest female botanical and scientific illustrators and artists, Ora White Hitchcock. She was a prolific illustrator and artist known for her botanical drawings like this beautiful carnation. Maybe I imagine some of you know her work. There were many exhibitions uh, not too long ago. Um, the works that really struck me in particular were her drawings on linen that her husband, Edward Hitchcock, used to teach geology courses with at Amherst University. The images are abstract, not based on what one could fully see at the time, but more on what was imagined and surmised. The compositions are striking, and although their use was utilitarian, and Ora White Hitchcock did not take particular pride in them at the time compared to her bot botanical illustrations, they now look like modern works of art. I pale compared to her, but I tried. <laughs> I started to work on my own sketches of imagined interior landscapes and to think about the role of captions and illustrations and their functions in books as we know them, and to ponder on both the limitations and the power of book illustrations in general. I also created a series of stenciled text drawings to create layer, layers of text piling up into verbal strata, accumulating and compressing over time. Another inspirational text I had read that influenced this work was an essay by Robert Smithson called Hidden Trails in Art, where he describes, describes the realm of the printed art journal that he was involved with at the time. I quote, its binding is an axis and its covers paper hemispheres. Turn to any page between these hemispheres and you, like Gulliver and Ulysses, will be transported into a world of traps and marvels. This axis splits into a chasm in your hands. Thus, you begin your travels by being immediately lost. Smithson continues, in this magazine is a series of pages that open into double terrains because we always see two pages at once. Writing drifts into strata and becomes a buried language. So the book took shape. It is bound in a sturdy handmade paper by Twin Rocker, and it resides in a printed linen bag. Uh, for one, because I wanted to carry through Ora White Hitchcock's use of fabric with her geological drawings, and also because I thought it helped the book be defined more as an artifact on its own. The linen is letterpress printed and hand colored with some thread looped and sewn at the top, which connects to some of the imagery on the inside of the book. And the book itself is sewn on linen tapes as well as garden twine in the center sewing station. And the end, end sheets, which you can catch a glimpse of, are also twin rocker paper. I really like the idea of exposing part of the spine, overtly showing the strata and accumulation of pages that make up a book. I have the great fortune now, as Peter was mentioning, to work in the Bancroft Library um, here at UC Berkeley, where I teach a course called The Handprinted Book in its historical context, uh, which I was going to mention had been taught by many illustrious individuals, including Peter. <laughs> um, some of my favorite books, though, to show the students whenever I teach from a rare book collection are actually the ones that are falling apart. <laughs> so we can read all the histories and secrets attached to not only the object itself, but its makers, its readers, and its users. The culture that the book is inevitably attached to and a reflection of. You can see that this is an earlier model, actually, as I had initially tried using the garden twine for more of the sewing stations, but later opted for the flatter linen tapes where they are woven through the covers. The title page is sparse and uses Baskerville as the typeface and is printed from photopolymer plates, as is the epigraph by Smithson. Not the whole one that I read, just part of it. And then we enter into the book content, which is read primarily via the imagery and the materials themselves with very little text. 
The minimal text or narrative is presented as continuously reading image captions. The paper goes between very smooth circle paper and rough handmade paper from cave paper made by Bridget O'Malley. And the text starts off here stating, it's understood. For this text, I used metal type, a gothic sans serif, and the imagery is printed from photopolymer plates and hand colored with colored pencil. The text across all of the images reads, it's understood between us, the measure of all things, a few words worn around the edges, pressed into something soft and made solid over time. On the recto sides of these verso pages are the text accumulation drawings uh, made into prints, which were um, build, build up over the series of pages. And these are also printed from photopolymer plates. There was a sound piece I was gonna play you <laughs> at the end, um, which basically of this presentation, it kind of comes from this text. Uh, and I'll mention this later too in the presentation. I also wanted to note that the knotted and looped thread, which are part of the book's imagery, are inspired by kipu, recording devices many of you are no doubt familiar with, fashioned from knotted strings and historically used by a number of cultures in the region of Andean South America to store and transport information. Here, the knotting and looping can be used to consider the passage of time an attempt to quantify or hold on to our existence, our loves, when seemingly so fleeting when compared to deep, uh, the deep time of geology and the earth. There is also imagery in the spreads of the rougher brown paper that I can show you if you come see this book at my table at the fair. If I'm there, <laughs> I have three tables. <laughs> Um, I was then invited to participate in the Words on the Edge Assembling Exchange Portfolio produced by the Codex Foundation and organized as a part of the extraction Art on the Edge of the Abyss monumental endeavor, which you'll hear more about from Sam Peltz tomorrow. Uh, printers were paired with authors, and I was very happy to be paired with Barry Lopez. Having lived in Portland, Oregon for 14 years before Reno, I was familiar with this work and had seen beautiful fine press bookwork of his writings before. In particular, I think of Sandy Tilcock of Lone Goose Press, who published a highly collaborative and beautiful book called Apologia that several artists I know in the audience have worked on. I didn't know Barry Lopez well, but I'm lucky to have been able to work with him before his passing in 2020. I worked with an excerpt from an essay he wrote titled, Informed by Indifference. This broadside was printed from metal type and wood type while I was working at the Black Rock Press at the University of Nevada, Reno, where they have a truly vast collection of wood type now. I would say one of the best in the US. I printed the book of the broadside, um, oh, excuse me, I printed the back of the broadside so a ghost of a mountain appears through the front. I used handset type and manipulated it in the bed of the press so it looks like the words are shifting and twisting as if buried in the earth. And just to read a small excerpt. Nothing, there is no history, until you bore into the layers of rock or until the balls of your fingertips run the rim of a partially exposed fossil. At the height of the austral summer in December, you smell nothing but the sun-beaten stone. In a silence dense as water, your eye picks up no movement but the sloughing of sand seeking its angle of repose. A nice Wallace Stegner reference there. I read Stegner's angle of repose on moving back to California um, where I grew up. It was set in the very region between Reno and San Francisco. And I don't know how well you can see it, but this is what the type looked like in the bed of the press. And I went <laughs> on to use this technique in other projects. Many of my students are always saying, how did those Dadas do that stuff with the type? <laughs> stuff like this, gum, I don't know. <laughs> Pieces of cotton. Um, so I continued using this technique of kind of pushing and pulling the type around. Uh, like these collage scrolls whose forms are based on player piano rolls. I don't get to show these often at the book fair. Um, 
They're about 15 feet tall and combine different printed and non-printed papers to again create a kind of core sample, a core sample of printed materials, paper, book cloth, letter forms, and words. I made this piece fairly quickly during a two-week residency at the Penland School of Craft with their metal and wood type collection. The texts were taken from the lost and forgotten books buried in the library stacks. One was a random science book just about lava, and the other was a book about sociolinguistics. It says, um, the importance of language in the human spirit is profound and historical evidence of the use of language as a weapon of colonization is explored. Again, we come back to the juxtaposition of both the mundane nature of language that surrounds us and the powerful role that language can play in perceiving, manipulating, and controlling others. Even something that is supposed to be objective, like an encyclopedia definition or the history of a nation, is often weighted down and sometimes saturated by bias. Although occasionally unintentional, it is frequently more intentional than we might like to come to terms with. This image shows the top and the bottom of the scrolls. In the beginning, I showed you the one-of-a-kind book titled Deposits with a Small D. Um, this is what kind of it led to, that is titled Deposits with a Big D, capital D. The book is shown here, both folded up in its case on the shelf on the left of the ladder, and also a copy is hanging on the wall to the right. This book was made to be experienced as part of an installation, so the book ends up being an artifact of this experience. It still functions on its own, but I'm trying to underscore the idea of the book as a cultural artifact with the installation. Deposits is actually part of a series I've been working on called the Active Reading Series, where readers are meant to be actively, physically involved in the reading experience, even to exaggeration. The idea or question being, do our bodies and minds process information differently when actively involved with the physical book? Of course, the answer is yes. I hear everybody's mind waves <laughs> coming from the audience. But the act of reading Sirius is a playful exploration of this. To get people to actually climb the ladder, there's a sound element playing softly on the small shelf above. So you would hear voices emitting from the speaker, hopefully enticing you up the ladder to read the book while ascending or descending the ladder. The book was made in an edition of 15 copies, and this is the case or hardcover wrapper. Again, at the ends, you can see the book's strata or pages. And on the inside, you can see the handset type printed amongst the imagery, which is relief printing from linoleum sheets and collagraphs printed from torn book bookboard on Asuka paper. Like the first deposit sketchbook, this text is also made of simultaneously significant yet random men memories. I started this project during a summer residency in the basement print shop at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, where uh, the basement was actually a very lovely place to be during the warm and humid Minneapolis summer. <laughs> and the book was later finished in my own studio Actually, if I'm honest, it's still being finished as the binding's kind of a bear. The back side of the book is really rough grit belt sandpaper, kind of murder on the hands to work with, but it lends a really nice weight and texture, um, unique quality to the book. The contrast between smooth and rough gives a kind of terrain or landscape to the book. And so this is where you can imagine a spoken word piece. <laughs> and I'll just end by kind of going through these last two slides. But thank you very much. Thank you all for being here, for wearing your masks <laughs> uh, and enduring that. Uh, and we'll see you at the fair. Thank you. Um, we have a, next up a five-minute-ish uh, announcement from Aaron Kohick, who I know many of you know, but I would like to introduce him. Um, he has a very exciting announcement and proposal, uh, but Aaron publishes his own work and that of other writers under New Lights Press, which approaches publishing as an artistic practice. 
He is also the printer of the press at Colorado College. Many of you also know Aaron because he is very active in the book arts community. So thank you for that. <laughs> he has come to the Codex Foundation with an idea to support new and emerging book artists and printers at the book fair, and we are excited to support this endeavor. Uh, I will let him explain further, so please welcome Aaron. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, so uh, thanks, Peter and Susan and Dina and Inga, um, for asking me to um, just present really quickly today. Um, so I had this idea, and I emailed Peter, and Peter was like, oh, that's a great idea. Can you organize that? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to start a fellowship for emerging artists um, who, to show at the Codex Fair. Um, and so the idea is that... Uh, um, folks who identify as emerging artists, first-time exhibitors, when they apply to show, they can also apply to uh, be considered for this fellowship. Um, and um, yeah, and we're also we're going to prioritize applications from folks who are from backgrounds that are upper, underrepresented in the book arts field, and also people with financial need. Um, and the uh, how does it work? We're going to give a full table uh, to two. Uh, there'll be two fellows every cycle. Um, and those, for the first cycle, those two fellows will receive a full table. And then, and for the cycle last, or sorry, <laughs> the grant fellowship cycle lasts for two codexes. Um, codices, yes. Um, and uh, so your first year, you get a full table. And then the second year, you get half of a full table paid for. Um, and then so we'll have two fellows the first year and then four um, the second cycle starting to um, move through people through. I hope I explained that in a way that made sense. Um, so and the Codex Foundation is supporting uh, part of this. Um, and then we're also um, when we register for the next fair, um, you will all be able to donate at the time of registration to help support um, this as well. Um, and um, we're at my table, um, table 150 and 151 for two presses that I run. Um, we're doing a silent auction um, to help also seed this. So uh, Amos Kennedy graciously donated um, a series of prints from his Rosa Parks series um, that were uh, silent auctioning. And then he also donated a book. So he made a book at Colorado College just like a month ago. Um, and it's the only copy that's going to go on sale. It's called An Experiment Combining Bad Printing and Bad Book Binding. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have that at the table, um, and so you can come and bid on that, and then we're going to use the money to support this fellowship for the Codex Foundation and also to support the inclusivity grants that the Fine Press Book Association does. Um, and the other thing you all can do if you would like to help is we want this to be juried by um, folks in the community. So if you're interested in uh, joining, we'll put together a small group of people to help choose the fellowship folks. Um, so if anybody's interested in doing that, just let me know. There'll be more opportunities, but um, come by uh, the, my tables at the fair, um, 150, 151, and, um, and let me know if you'd like to participate at all. And yeah, and if you have any other questions. Okay, thank you all. Uh, all right, I'd like to now take the opportunity to introduce to you uh, William Fox, who might know as Bill from 50 years ago or more, but uh, William is a director of the Center for Art and Environment at the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno, Nevada. And he has, according to his quick biography, variously been called an art critic, a science writer, and a cultural geographer. Uh, I also know him as a poet because in my youth uh, I read his from his journal called the West Coast Poetry Review. He's published 16 books on cognition, art, and the landscape, and more than 100 essays in art monographs, magazines, and journals, and 15, coll 15 collections of poetry. Uh, 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 Bill has researched and written books set in the Antarctic, the Arctic, the Himalaya and the deserts of Chile, Austria, Australia, and the United States. He's a fellow of both the Royal Geographical Society and the Explorers Club in New York City. 
and recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim uh, Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Foundation, uh, uh, Science Foundation. And his most recent book is Michael Heiser, The Once and Future Monuments. Uh, uh, he's, a, an, uh, he, he's an artist, activist, archivist, artist in the sense of words and poetry. And since in 2009, the Center for Art and Environment at the Nevada Museum of Art has been collecting individual artists and art organizational archives, documenting human creative interactions with natural built and the virtual environments. More than a million and a half items from more than 1,500 artists working in all seven continents comprise a unique and resource that brings together art, science, and traditional indigenous practices to help researchers create new knowledge about our world. Uh, most of these archives are from living and environmentally active artists. Uh, I would like to suggest that for those of you who haven't visited the Nevada Museum of Art to get there as, you know, as often and as certainly as soon as you can. It's really a first class museum and, and Bill's perch in the archives up on the second level is, uh, is, is a library to be uh, envied. Uh, so without any more here, let's move along. Thank you very much for joining us, Bill. You know, uh, when Ada left Reno after her seven years there, uh, it was a tremendous loss to us. Uh, the Center for Art Environment really depends on strong partners, especially uh, those anchored at the University of Nevada. Um, and so she left, and um, you know, the literature and environment uh, program at the university had also been put to bed. Um, so those were the two main, main losses that we had. However, if you had to go somewhere, this is perfectly splendid. It's <laughs> wonderful that you're here at COVID. So Inga, I, I really look forward to a continuing collegial relationship. And the, the links between Reno and San Francisco culturally have been uh, historical and, and quite robust since the 1860s. So we, 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 hate, we uh, understand how to find you. So, <laughs> um, Look, I, we consider books to be the original virtual environment. Uh, it's an analog uh, virtual environment, not a digital one. And I'm going to show you some examples uh, of things that we have in the collections, those 15, uh, 1.5 million items, soon to be 2 million items. Um, the center is expanding uh, to be six times larger than it is now. Uh, and we'll have a library on the first floor of this new addition to the museum. And then our archiving operation will be on the second floor. On that first floor and in that library, uh, there will be a great sweeping bookcase that will be the first thing you encounter. Uh, and that's going to be a, basically a cabinet of wonder. And in that cabinet will be some of these items that I'm going to show you. that will be really heavily uh, vested in book arts. Um, the book art collection for, in my purview, I guess, starts really with illustrated artist journals. This is Cedra Wood. Uh, she lives in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, and she has been one of those people to travel on residencies uh, to places like Australia and Svalbard. I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. You can see how these hand-lettered, one-of-a-kind, exquisite journals look. Uh, her handwriting uh, takes a little bit of getting used to. And then once you enter into that great cursive, looping set of words, you just fly away. It's marvelous. And her illustrations are, are acute and delicate and, and just exquisite. Um, but she also, and here she's sending me things from Svalbard. Uh, and she's, so she's now gone to the opposite side of the planet, almost literally, uh, and she's rolling up these little hand scrolled messages uh, that look very much like her journal book pages, right? Same kind of handwriting, same kind of illustrations. And these are just a lovely example of the many field journals that we have in the collection. Uh, this is a, a small book on vellum, um, letterpress printing and polymer plate, plate printing um, and linoleum cuts on vellum. Um, Megan Berman, I do you remember this? Yeah, because yeah, it's on black black press. Um, and it's a lovely conflation of geography, um, of different kinds. It's not one place, it's many places put in between covers. Uh, and it's a very nice example of what happens to people when they come to Reno and they begin to engage with the environment? It's such a large and visually compelling environment that they really feel the need to do something about that in whatever project they're working on at the press. Um, so 
still making, okay, there we go. Sarah Goodsimmons is someone I met in Switzerland on a very small town called Tenna in eastern Switzerland up in the mountains. Um, these are water books uh, next to a, a Bible on a bench in a small church that's there. Um, the water books are basically plastic books that are hollow, that are filled with water from specific places. Here she is taking water from the local river and she has connected it to a water book made with water from the Atlantic Ocean, which is where that river goes to eventually, after joining some other larger rivers, the Rhine in particular. Um, so uh, there's this thing in Ecclesiastes basically that says, you know, all the rivers flow to the ocean, and once they get to the ocean, the water returns, and it's a big cycle. And it's a very, very early description of a, a, you know, the hydrological cycle of the planet. Uh, found in Ecclesiastes, and so she thought putting these in the church uh, would be a, a fine thing to do, to sort of make a trope out of this, so and it's a lovely work. I do not own one of these water books because my partner and our archivist, Sarah, Sarah, um, she said, honey, really, you're going to put a book of water in the archives? That's a bad idea. <laughs> so, so we've been having this discussion, and uh, I'm bound and determined. Uh, Sarah and I have negotiated uh, what we're going to do, and, and uh, I think Sarah's going to just have to live with, you know, Dave Mabel's back there kind of grinning. He, he knows this entire operation. In fact, David helped us put together the library, the research library, uh, design the, the collection uh, at, the, at the museum. This is Cedra Wood's sister. Her name is Bethany Loranda Wood. Uh, she teaches at the University of Iowa, and this is a beautiful little tunnel book. Um, it is, was made from her experience at double negative. So if those of you who know the work of, of Robert Heiser or even at Land Arts, you know the double negative is a set of two trenches, 50 feet deep, uh, dug on the edge of a mesa, a Mormon mesa in southern Nevada, and they together they comprise a unit that's about 1,500 feet long. It's longer than the Empire State Building is tall. Um, and it's a very early man artwork and a very important exploration of what is, how do you make a sculpture out of negative space? Instead of putting something positive in a space, what happens when you take something out of the space and it makes a sculpture? So double negative uh, is this wonderful experience for uh, students in the Land Arts of the American West program run out of both the University of New Mexico and Texas Tech. She was in the Texas Tech program. Cedar was actually in one in, in uh, the University of New Mexico. And so this little time book, um, it's very mysterious. I mean, you look through it, um, and ah, I keep pressing the wrong button. That's, there we go. Come on, thank you. Um, you look through it and you realize you are looking into a landscape and what you find in there is a picture of this guy in a hat who's Michael Heiser, the artist. So she's, what she's done is she's, and you can see the, the other trench across the mesa in the, in the background in one of the far pages. So this is a, uh, an, just an exquisite object. Uh, she's also a jeweler and she makes books that are basically big rings and things that you can wear around your neck and so we have some of those in the collection too. Um, I'm not quite sure how we're going to display this, how we're going to actually have a way for people to look into that book. I'm really anxious for kids to be able to look into this book, so I'm going to put it low on those shelves in the front of the library, but I'm not quite sure how we're going to open it up. So uh, I guess we'll see. This is a book made out of plate steel. Um, it is only three pages long, and it weighs about 100 pounds. Uh, yeah. Gene Flores, uh, an artist who passed away recently, uh, lived for a while with his wife uh, up on Tehachapi Pass, and he was looking down on the Mojave Desert. Uh, and you can see as, as this begins to unfold, it has the shapes of the mountains and uh, rivers and gullies and stuff embedded in it. I apologize uh, for the photographs because they don't really show you uh, the full depth of what's going on uh, in the features of the landscape in the, in the patina on the steel. Um, we have three of these books. I do want to put one of these books on display in a case, and I'm not quite sure, again, how to handle that. It's going to be very interesting. I mean, it's easy enough to design these armatures. They're actually meant to be hung on a wall, um, and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to display it fully open or kind of half open and half closed. I don't know. Um, this is uh, Vivian Ramon Seppi, whom I met in the same village in Switzerland uh, as Sarah Fitzsimmons. And um, this is this marvelous map work 
made an homage to her father who, when he was 15 years old, walks out of northern Italy over the Alps into Switzerland uh, and settled in a town uh, where he made his living uh, uh, as a craftsperson for the rest of his life. Uh, and where she grew up, uh, she lives jointly now between Sion, uh, which is in uh, Switzerland, or kind of central Switzerland, and, uh, and New York City. Um, and what she's done is she's sewn these maps together. So the original, the background map is the map that he had uh, of the region, and that he was using as he was walking. And then these other maps, more contemporary ones, are layered underneath. It's, it's something you almost want to play with your fingers. And it's only about this big. So it's not, it's not a large object, and uh, it's, that one's an easy one to display. Um, the idea of using a map as a book, as something you read, almost like a text, that you're reading the landscape, is one that uh, I like a lot. And we're familiar with that. We have many examples of artists working with maps uh, to turn it into something that you read like a book. And that's just lovely. So um, I was thrilled uh, when Inga showed you the little quote from Barry Lopez about the Antarctica from the Informed by Indifference essay. Um, I went to the Antarctica so I could write an art history of it. I spent three months on the ice and uh, got to go a lot of different places. Um, I went to see Barry before I went. And Barry said, I want you to go to one particular place in the dry valleys. It's part of the Antarctica. It's about 3% that's not covered with ice, right? And he said, I want you to go sit next to this carcass of a seal that's been there for thousands of years. It's so dry, it's a place where it doesn't rain. I mean, it, and then snow barely accumulates at all. Um, and I want you to sit there, and you, I want you to then come back to me and tell me if you felt anything in that landscape, if it talked to you, if it spoke to you, because it didn't speak to me. I found it, you know, on Stephen Pine, but it was an information sink. Um, so I went to that place, and I sat down next to that desiccated seal, and I picked up a small rock next to the, the carcass, and I turned it over, and it was red. And it looked like bacteria. The place was crawling with life, but you, you wouldn't know unless you actually picked up and turned over a stone that there were things living in that valley, not just dead things. So, so I went back to Barry, and I told him about the experience, and I said, I had a lovely time there. It was great. <laughs> totally talking to me. He was like, Rrr. So anyway. Um, so this is the East Antarctic uh, ice sheet. Uh, I'm sorry, the West Antarctic ice sheet. It's one that's melting and moving fairly rapidly. Um, it's one of those places where if it disappears, uh, the city will be underwater. So we hope that it doesn't disappear. Uh, scientists go there to not only to look at how the ice is doing, how it's faring, as it were, but they also go there to drill an ice core and to pull up a sample of uh, a long tube of ice that represents 68,000 years of climate change. And an artist, Anna McKee, uh, also went down there with the National Science Foundation, uh, and she, um, she finds a laboratory to work with to take water from a, every few meters along the ice core. So she makes this work, um, called Rod Query, and what you're looking at are these glass ampules into which the little drop of water is put from every few meters. So this piece that hangs, you can see the fabric in the background, um, this piece that hung looking like this, uh, it consists of these colored strips of silk that she hand dyes, and they are cut according to, so the color and the length and the width of the strips. Um, there's 4,000 of them, and they are cut to the atmospheric conditions and the chemical composition of the atmosphere at that particular place in the ice core throughout the 68,000 year history. A scientist can walk in and see this hanging on the wall, or hanging from the ceiling, actually, in front of the wall. And by looking at that bottom curve, the scientists will say, oh, I know exactly what that is. If it's a climate, it's a climate scientist. They'll say, that's that famous 68,000 year graph of what the Earth's atmosphere is doing. So, all of these little uh, glass ampules, she then placed into this. This is the actual drill bit made to make that four kilometer long ice core to pull it up out of the ice and send it back to a uh, lab in the United States, in Washington State. So uh, now, I, you know, geologists would talk about in the 19th century reading the Grand Canyon, reading the different strata, and that was the, the great book of Earth, uh, right, the Bible of geology. 
Um, I think an ice core is somewhat the same thing. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a record of what transpired. It is geologic in nature. Water, by the way, is not the most common uh, form uh, of, of that particular molecule. It's actually ice in the universe. Water is mostly present as ice, and uh, so is classified as a mineral, not as a liquid that we drink necessarily. So, um, so I think this is related to book objects. I don't think it is one. I think it's at the farthest end of the spectrum that I can think of that I'll put in that great curved bookcase, right? Next to these other objects that I've just shown you. I think that this is as, about as far as I can take reading an object and reading an artist's work as a book that's not really a book. So um, this is a, a, just a, an exquisite example of, of how far I think we can take that. I'm going to stop there because we're a little bit, you know, lacking in time. Uh, I think, do we have time for questions and answers? Yeah, we have, we, have a, we have a good five minutes. Okay, that's great. So, yeah, if you have any questions, then please. Yeah, yes. Um, what was the scale of that core that you just showed us? Yeah, so the, the drill itself um, is three feet long and six inches in diameter. So it's not, it's not, not big. Yeah. And it has in it, it's got, I mean, there are 4,008 ampules in there. So she cuts the strips, she dyes them by hand, she goes to the lab where the ice core is, and under the supervision of that staff, collects ice, you know, every few meters, makes the ampules herself, puts the, the under sterile conditions, puts the butter in there, seals them. Um, it took her years to make this device, yeah. So it's a... A little intensive. I mean, it reminds me of English books, actually. Yeah, so, other questions? Yes. Where, where is the piece hanging? Where? Where is it hanging? So you're looking at uh, um, shots from an installation at the Nevada Museum of Art. We premiered that work, and then it went to Colorado, and then it went to New Hampshire. It went to all the ice labs in, in the United States, basically, where they have ice cores. Um, and currently, it is in storage in her studio in Seattle, and it is coming to us. I think in May or June. The center is expanding, the museum is expanding greatly, as I said, um, so it won't be on display until 2025. So. David? I'm sorry, yeah, something's back there. Right? Oh, yes, right in front of you. Could you say something about the word soul nostalgia? <laughs> yeah, yeah, soul nostalgia. Um, a word coined by an Australian uh, cultural geographer. Um, so nostalgia is when you, what you feel when you lose something, not by moving, not by having nostalgia for a place that you left. It's where a place leaves you. So for example, in the Hunter Valley, which is what he was looking at, a place with great coal mines now that are threatening the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the people who live on the land there talk about the immense feeling of loss with all the trees being cut down from the mines. And that's when he coined that, that's when he coined that term. And it's, thank you for asking that question. It's a, uh, it's a remarkable concept and, and, and one that I've deployed a lot of times. Yeah. So, yes. Well, I think we should uh, call the end of the questions. We have, I don't want to introduce Robert. And Very good. Robert Ringhurst, who is, uh, as he reminded me, he was sleeping on the couch in the house in Reno. I think we were actually in the bedroom, I can't remember. It was a real bit. That's remarkable. Anyway, so it's a, it is such an honor to be with this group of people and all of you, uh, colleagues of the heart, colleagues of the soul, as well as of the mind. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, uh, I also want to make sure that you understand that the uh, Extraction uh, art on the edge of the abyss as a uh, as an art movement and intervention that had that grew from small roots in Missoula, Montana, to encompass uh, several continents. Uh, uh, Bill, right in the very beginning, had um, um, uh, volunteered his archives as the archival, uh, you know, home for the. Uh, extraction art in the edge of the abyss movement, and you will hear a little more about uh, that whole thing uh, tomorrow with Sam Pelt. And now I'm not, without a, taking a break, I'm going to get 
rather a short introduction in order to uh, prolong his uh, time with you. Uh, uh, Robert is a uh, poet and, and a typographer and a linguist. His books, the uh, elements of uh, his book, the elements of typographic style, uh, first published in '92, will celebrate its uh, 30th anniversary this year with the publication of a new fifth edition. And uh, uh, it has been widely translated and used by typographers, printers, and publishers around the world. It's probably the only poetic treatment of the history of type and the history of books that, that, that you know, really uh, it has endured. It doesn't, uh, doesn't become uh, trite and rereading. In fact, it becomes more exciting. Um, Bringhurst was for many years an active contributing editor of, the, of our legendary San Francisco journal, Fine Print. And his most recent book, books include Palatino, uh, The Natural History of a typeface, and uh, he's also a lifelong student of Native American languages and a major scholar, actually, in the field of oral literature. So let's welcome Robert. Thank you, Robert, for joining us. It's been, if I'm not mistaken, 15 years since the first codex, an event that I remember with great pleasure. Thank you. I've been looking forward to taking this thing off, but it's worth taking the rest of public speaking just to be able to get your mask off for him. He should all turn. Fifteen years, and while I have the chance, I just like to say that I'm filled with admiration for what my old friends Peter Koch and Susan Filter and all their colleagues have done here. And Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Us old guys have been having uh, various chats about how long it's been since this and how long since that. Probably was 50 years ago that I slept in Bill Fox's spare bed, or maybe it was a couch, I don't know. Uh, Peter and I go back to 1949 when we were both small boys in Missoula, Montana. Um, Peter was a couple of years older than I was, so I was about three, and I looked up to him, and he did not know of my existence, but uh, we did eventually get together about 30 years ago and start doing interesting things. Um, anyway, if you can beat that record. Uh, <clears throat> when I was first making notes for this talk over a year ago, I could not help thinking day after day about the ways in which the history of the book is entangled with the history of plagues and pandemics. Now, of course, the inescapable subject is the way the history of the book is entangled with the history of human warfare. How much work it is to make a page worth saving and how easily a modest number of frightened and deluded human beings can destroy entire libraries, cities, archives, and culture. That's my underlying theme, the, this wisp of a thing we call civilization, which in Ukrainian, I believe, is to Culture is everything that humans, that everything that living creatures pass on to future generations by non-genetic non means. We'll, we'll, we'll work this out eventually. <clears throat> humans, it, it, culture is not confined to humans. Humans may be the only creatures with libraries and books, but almost all mammals and birds teach things to their young. Civilization is the fabric that culture creates as it spreads out and builds up in space and time. That fabric is partly physical, but never entirely so. It's a partial fusion of creatures and their environments. Civilization is a state in which you can't tell the dancer from the dance or from the dance floor either. It's a perishable state, a perishable substance, constantly 
falling apart and being repaired, and it is certainly not limited to human beings. The forest is a civilization, not a human civilization, but a civilization all the same. That's why it's so heart-wrenching to see a forest burn, or to see one clear cut. Autocrats and demagogues never create or maintain civilizations. All they ever do is damage or destroy them. And so you have to wonder why humans so often choose deluded people, destroyers instead of creators and leaders, as we often do. Why do we keep wrecking what we do? And also what we didn't build and can't replace when it's gone. Civilizations grow as forests do, and they cannot grow forever, but does that mean they have to be destroyed? Or that we have to destroy them? This is a simple sentence from Aristotle's physics. Todo geist in hakron which means something like, this is the nature of time, or this is what time is. Aristotle wrote this sentence, but he wouldn't be able to read it in the form that you see here. This is ancient Greek set in type in high Renaissance style. Greek as it was written and typeset and read in some of the more privileged parts of Europe for about 300 years, beginning late in the 15th century. Aristotle was the most famous and most admired of all ancient authors during that time, yet his work was being published and presented in a form he would not have recognized. We do this all the time, and the forest does it all the time, too, recycling insights and ideas into new and different forms, growing things. Aristotle would have written the sentence like this, in what you might call Greek block capitals, printing in the schoolroom sense of the word, without any spaces between the words and with none of the fancy diacritics that every student of classical Greek has had to learn for the past 2,000 years. One thing you can, we can learn from these two images, these two versions of this sentence, is you can't judge a language by its cover, just as you can judge a book by its cover. You can judge a book in part by its typography and its printing, printing in a grown-up sense of the word, because those are intrinsic parts of a physical book, just as muscles and skin are part of your physical body. But a script, an orthography, is not part of a language. Script is a costume that language wears, or doesn't wear, as the case may be. So here's a puzzle. Language may take the form of a puff of air, or some marks on a page, or scratches on stone, or motions of the hand, but it does not have a physical body. It has something like a mind, what the Chinese call Xin, a mind heart, a heart mind, or something like what the Greeks call Puke, breath, life, spirit, soul. Language has life. It also has death. Every language is mortal, perishable, a living thing that will not live forever. Languages like sequoias and bristletone pines can live for thousands of years but they do not live forever. They can stay in one place, they can spread across the globe, mutating as they go, and they can change very quickly or very slowly. They have an impact on the world, but they are immaterial beings. They take up no physical space, they weigh nothing. Nevertheless, they wear clothes, or they can. How do they do that? That's a metaphysical question, and it might deserve a metaphysical answer, but I have a long-standing suspicion that it really has a biological answer, and maybe we'll get to that in a moment. These, by the way, are two different ways of writing the same Chinese text. So a monk named Hui Su, who was born in the early 8th century in Changsha, Eastern Hunan wrote the first version you saw of this, that version. 
Perhaps you could read that scribal version very easily, though most of us find it quite difficult. He could certainly have read this version too. And the moral again is that language can wear lots of different clothes. The underlying mystery is how with a physical body it can wear any clothes at all. Here are the first four lines of that passage in two different forms. Cursive writing is one thing when your letters have two or three strokes, like a Latin A or B or C, but when your characters, individual characters, have 10 or 12 or 20 strokes each, cursive is something else. The text reads down from, and to the left, starting at the upper right. Please look closely at the third line. You'll see that all of the third character and all of the next four characters, that's 49 strokes in all, have been written with one movement of the brush. That's equivalent to writing more or less a whole English pentameter line, to be or not to be, that is the question, for example, with one motion of the pen, one, one pen stroke. There are some very impressive ligatures in the European manuscript tradition, but I've never seen one that's a... Generally, in the European tradition, so long as the scribes wrote texts in continuous strings with no spaces between the words, they kept the individual letters discreet, often very close together, but seldom really joined together. In that respect, formal Greek and Latin script used to be like formal Chinese, a steady stream of separate glyphs. And that's what you see here in this papyrus, a few lines from the 15th book of the Iliad, probably copied by a Greek scribe on the north coast of Egypt in the first century of the Common Era. When the scribes began to put spaces between the words, they also started tying the letters within the word together. The word, not the phoneme or the syllable, became a visible entity and even a tactile entity. This is the hand of the greatest literary detective of the Renaissance, Poggio Bracciolini, who was born in 1380 and died in 1459. Actually, it's one of his many hands. Poggio was a polymathic and a polymanual man, a Renaissance man. He could write language in a lot of different ways, dress it in a lot of different clothes, and he makes it look easy. There were no fountain pens or felt tip pens in Poggio's day that would give you a nice effortless even flow of ink, but a nice even flow is what you see when he uses the pen. There is almost no trace of the back and forth movement between the page and the inkwell, but part of making the page. And there are on this page a lot of 10 and 12 letter words that look as if they were written without ever lifting the nib from the paper. They weren't, but Poggio makes it look as if they were. It's as if the words have turned into glyphs, though instead of the 24 letters of the Latin alphabet, or 48, counting caps and lowercase, you have the 30 or 40,000 words in Poggio's Latin vocabulary. This is a way of making the page very subtle and beautiful, but from a typographer's point of view, it's also a way of making Latin as complex as Chinese. The history of script in Europe and Asia alike is partly a story of the constant tug of war between joining letters together and splitting them apart. It sounds childishly simple, and I guess it is. But it's also the tragicomic story of our schizophrenic species, the constant back and forth between analysis and synthesis, left brain and right brain, complexifying and simplifying, looking for holes and looking for parts. It's built into the vertebrate brain, and by Poggio's time, it was also built into the alphabet. The older, slower capital letters are more prone to stand apart than the younger, lowercase letters more prone to join together. Huai Su is a Buddhist monk and a contemporary of Gibai and Dufu, 
was where you'd expect them to be, more on the synthetic than the analytical. Is it something wrong again? Look at that. More on the synthetic than the analytical side of this graphic debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but of course, Feister, like all the rest of us, really has to be on both sides, the complexifying and the simplifying side. It's the only possible choice. Calligraphers like typographers and Buddhist monks like rabbis and bishops and hunter-gatherers have to be able to see both trees and forests, parts and whole. We've looked at two contrasting ways of writing or setting this little bit of Chinese, but a piece of literature isn't like a piece of paper with only two sides, and reality isn't a coin that always comes up heads or tails. Both sides of the brain have work to do, and they have to work together in order to do it. This proof of that, this same text, can be written in many other ways. Like this, for example, in which the 40 Han characters become 124 Latin lines. The typeset Latin letters have none of the spirit of Weissu's calligraphy, but they give a pretty decent representation of the sound of what he says in modern Mandarin. In fact, they represent the sound a good deal better than the Chinese characters do. Weissu, however, would have found this completely unintelligible. It's possible that he had heard of the Roman alphabet, but very unlikely he'd ever seen it. And he could not have been familiar with Pinyin Romanization, which wasn't invented until 1958. Still, this is in some sense the same text, the same six lines, the same 40 words. It's a different performance of that text and a very different way of clothing the same invisible meanings, the same little thicket of language. And like any performance, it also modifies the meanings it reveals. Not all cultural transformations are that straightforward. If you could take Hui Su back to the place he was born nearly 1,300 years ago, he wouldn't recognize it at all. Changsha, a town on the Shan River in Hunan, used to look something like this. Now it looks like this instead. Unreal, some of us would say, absolutely real and proof of the greatness and unity of China, others would say. Either way, we do tend to say that it's the same place, but it isn't the same place. How the place looks is not the only thing that's changed. The place that used to be here, the fabric linking humans and non-humans to each other, and that place, the civilization of that place, has been destroyed, and a different one has replaced it. A different kind of place is there. When this happens, you can't go home again. But of course, you can still try, you can still pretend, and people do. So people from Changsha sometimes drive five hours west to that other much smaller village, Tonghuang, to get an idea of what China was like before it became so successful that you couldn't tell the difference between Changsha and Chicago. They go there and they float around on the river in little tour boats and they say to one another, isn't it lovely? This is how China used to be. But of course, it isn't. Feng Huang has become a theme park, a kind of Disneyland, whose function is to sell you the illusion that you're visiting old China. I hope that you might think of this next time you pick up a book, and you might ask yourself, is it real or is it a fake? Is it real or is it a theme park for words? <laughs> the question applies to the physical book. Is it in fact a book, an organic machine that facilitates reading? Or is it a simulacrum, a paper brick stuck together with some glue, perhaps disguised with a fake case binding? The question also applies to the letter forms. Are they real in any sense, or just a pixelated parody or caricature of a manuscript hand or a typeface? Most urgently of all, the question applies to the text and the editing of the text. Is there really anything there to read? 
Is it genuine food or junk food? Books, after all, don't have to be physical. They can be lovely when they are, but that's not the only option. And in fact, it's a very recent option. For 98 or 99 percent of human history, books were oral. They had no place except in the minds and hearts and voices of human beings. Those were the only libraries. With or without writing, humans store up literature as they store up food, because, of course, literature is food. I'd like to show you a photograph of a healthy oral literature, but of course, no such photographs exist. This, however, is a village, or was a village, on an island off the coast of British Columbia, and a real oral literature was living in this village in 1880 when this photograph was taken. There were no physical books, there was no system of writing, but this village, like thousands of other villages and camps all over North America, was a library. The name of this village was Hogar. The language spoken there was Haida. The Haida poets knew that they lived at the interface of two great non-human civilizations, the forest and the ocean. Their poems, their stories acknowledge this in many wonderful ways. Every human community has a human language and every human language has a literature. Every pre-literate human community had an oral literature and there have been pre-literate human communities for something like 200,000 years. Yet now with a global population of eight billion human beings, healthy, pre-literate human communities are very nearly extinct. Maybe that helps to explain why now, the bogus claims of Steven Pinker notwithstanding, humanity has become more destructive and more self-destructive than ever before. Literacy itself, as Ingham mentioned not long ago, has become a tool of slavery and deceit as much as a tool of liberation. In this village, as in thousands of others, one form of literacy and one idea of the book was used as a weapon against another. And just as in the Spanish Civil War, the wrong side won. Thirty years later, the same village looked like this. Even then, it was still a library. Though the library was smaller and it had been and no longer open every day. And a lot of the oral books were in poor shape. It was still a library because there were still old people in the village who knew the stories and might tell them if no missionaries were listening. But it wasn't only missionaries who came. Bloggers started to come at the end of the 19th century and have been coming ever since. There is a civilization on one side of this photograph and no civilization on the other. And the miners came, gold miners, copper miners, iron miners, and others. Loggers and miners are hard on the land, and when the land suffers, the stories suffer too. Of course, the Haida needed trees for their houses, their poles, their canoes, they cut trees. They just didn't cut the whole forest. They also needed copper, but they didn't dig holes to side in order to get it. Well, along with the miners and the loggers and the missionaries, one lone ethnographic linguist also came into that village, a person who had come to hear the stories and knew how to write them down. His name was John Swanton, and he arrived in a village that looked like this in September 1900. He came from the Kennebec River country in Maine, and he had studied linguistics with Franz Boas at Harvard and Columbia. You could say anything to him in any human language, and he could write down what you said and read it back to you. He wouldn't at first know what the words meant, but he could record them with a pencil, and then he could learn the grammar and the lexicon, and soon enough he would know which words were which, and what they meant, and how they fit together. In the village he worked, the village he worked in looked like this, 
but to the people who lived in it, it they remembered it in this way. They remembered it as a place where the stories were still alive and the stories were still visibly alive. Swanton was a very good listener and a wonderfully, thank you again, yeah, uh, and a wonderfully humane and humanistic anthropologist, but he was not a Renaissance man and not a great calligrapher. And over the space of 11 months, he listened intently to dozens of old people and wrote down thousands of pages of Hydro-War literature in his notebooks. They look like this. They're not pretty, but they're worth reading. After a year in the Haida country, he returned to Washington, D.C., where he had an office at the Bureau of American Ethnology, and there he started typing. And then the stories came to look like this. Over 70 years later, I started working with Swanson's Haida transcripts, studying the language, studying the structure of the stories, identifying the individual myth tellers. And in due course, Haida Ora literature appeared in several books, including, oh, sorry, that's, that's Swanton's book. That's not mine. That's the 1905 version that Swanton published, uh, a collection of Haida texts in the strange alphabet that he used. In due course, Haida came to look like this. This is a little book published by Russell Moret in 2007. Russell might disown it now, since it's set in a type that he did not design himself, but it's a good type. It's a very good type, in fact, designed by Martin Mayur, and I hope Russell doesn't object to my showing it. More important than the type, which is very important, more important than the type, in my opinion, is how the words are arranged on the page, because that casts some light on the structure of the oral poetry Swanton heard, and manage to write down. One of the things that typography can do for oral literature is to preserve it, to carry it across time and space. But another thing it can do for oral literature is elucidate its structure and its texture. The patterns you see here on the page are audible to a listener if the listener is alert and knows the language. But unless typography brings the patterns out, most readers, who are usually just reading the translation, will miss the patterns in type. Typography is a skill, and a great skill like diamond cutting or carpentry, not a useless skill like golfing. But it becomes a useless skill if the typographer has nothing of substance to work with. If you use your typographic skill to sell laundry detergent and cake mix, or to get demagogues and psychopaths, and fools elected to public office, you're wasting your life. If you use it to shine light on a great and unknown literary tradition like this one, your life might not be wasted after all. <laughs> this too is oral literature, Greek oral literature, in a hand much more skillful than John Swanton's and considerably less disciplined than Pogba Bracheli. One difference between Greek oral literature and Haida or any other Native American oral literature is that the first scribes to record Greek oral literature were native speakers of ancient Greek. They knew how the poems were structured because they'd been hearing them and quoting them all their lives. Very few ethno-linguists have been that qualified. Another important difference is that after people started writing it down, Greek oral literature was nurtured and edited by the scribes for 2,000 years before it got into the hands of typography. Some very important parts of the original transcriber's knowledge was lost in this process, but the writing system itself was substantially improved. When the Iliad and the Odyssey finally came into the hands of typographers and printers, all they had to do was translate the scribal solutions into metal as best they could. No small job, and they took it on. What you see here, by the way, is part of the funeral scene in the last book of the Iliad, the funeral of Hector, the great defender of Troy. This is warfare, and the grief that comes with warfare transmuted into literature. 
It sounds even better than it looks. Hector, the name of the dead hero, means he holds everything together. And when Achilles has killed Hector, everything falls apart. But then at least the war is over and the poem can end. Anyway, one newer typographic problem is that the skill involved in setting Greek like this has pretty much been lost, even though some of the best Greek type from the 16th century survives. We still have the punches from the Greek to what? King's Greek. We have a lot of the early matrices. The fonts could be fully recreated. Here are the punches for four of the hundreds of ligatures. The first punch on the tray is upside down for some reason, but the others are right side up, and the punches are well worth looking at for their own sake. This is just wonderful in Greek. Though, of course, the question arises, could we do this with computers? And the answer is yes. You can, if you like, build a Greek font like this one with a thousand or twelve hundred ligatures and attach a list of substitution rules for putting those ligatures to work. Do that, and you can set good Chancery Greek, good Renaissance Greek on your laptop. It will take you a few years to build the font, at least it took me several years to build this one, but it can be done. No one can make money in this way, so no such <laughs> fonts. No, you've heard that before. No such fonts are sold by monotype or Adobe. Even among classicists, this kind of Greek stirs very little interest nowadays. It's hard enough for classicists to lure anyone into their classrooms to study Greek and Latin. Few of them are interested in making the subject harder and more interesting by holding a practicum in Renaissance aesthetics. But the people who made and used the original Renaissance Greek fonts weren't in it for the money either. Type like this has never been made except by people who insisted on doing so, who insisted that money was for making civilization and not the other way around. These punches were subsidized by the King of France, François Premier. The page I showed you a moment ago, printed by Henri Etienne in 1566, was subsidized by a man named Ulrich Fugger, the son of a banker. Fugger inherited a fortune and decided to spend it on books. Some of it on old books for his private collection, but much of it on making new and even better books for himself and everyone else. That is, he gave the money to Henri Etienne to subsidize Henri's massive publishing program using the fonts cut by Claude Garamond for his Henri's father, Robert Etienne. And we have many fine books in circulation today because Fugger made it possible for them to be printed, set and printed. Fugger is not as famous as Hitler or Stalin or Trump or Putin, but he was a man who understood a thing or two about civilization and did what he could to make it grow, not to destroy it. So did his father, Robert Etienne. So did the King of France. If you compare these two rows of punches now, the upper row with the stark symmetrical capitals and the lower row with the swirly, curly lower case, you'll also see something significant about the history of Latin and Greek script. There are hundreds of punches for the lower case in each of the three sizes of the royal Greek, and only 25 punches for the cap. So the cursive synthetic side of the Greek reading mind at this stage has far more material to work with than the inscriptional and analytic side. The caps, of course, are rooted in European inscriptions. The lowercase is rooted on a manuscript tradition that is substantially oriental. So there's something wonderfully Catholic in the secular lowercase sense of that word about this type. It embraces multiple traditions. 
inherently it brings things together rather than tearing them apart. This kind of convoluted, florid script never had much traction in Greece itself. I have done it again, I'm sorry. It was born and bred in Constantinople, where the Eastern Greeks saw and admired the Arabic script of the Ottoman Turks, the highly cursed mask and palpi scripts in particular, which were favorites of the Ottoman calligraphy. So in Constantinople, Greek script acquired some of the flavor of cursed Arabic. Arabic has no capitals, however, and the capital letters of the Eastern Greek scribes remained essentially untouched by Turkish influence. The two red caps that you see here, Omega and Sigma, on part of this page of a 15th century Iliad, are basically the same cramped, top-heavy, flat-serif, Byzantine forms that Greek scribes have been using for centuries, while the lower case is in what was then the latest fashion. It's a calligraphic tempest. When Constantinople fell to the Ottomans in 1453, and Greek scribes like Constantinos Lascaris, who wrote this page, this book, uh, took refuge in the West, those scribes took refuge in the West. West, they brought both kinds of letters with them, the Byzantine caps and the florid cursive lower case. Italian and French students of Greek were smitten by the lower case, which was like nothing they had ever seen, but they wanted nothing to do with those capitals. They were all familiar with classical inscriptions, both Latin and Greek, and had their own ideas about what Greek and Latin capitals should look like. Caps were supposed to be geometrically pure and therefore perfectly analyzable, while the lower case, especially italic and Greek lower case, was beyond the reach of computation. This view saved Western Europe from an infestation of pretty deplorable Greek Byzantine capitals, but it also cut the Renaissance off from its own rich heritage of Romanesque capitals. European typography might be quite different if Francesco Grifo and Aldous Manutius and Claude Garamond and Robert Tien had taken as much interest in Romanesque caps as they did in Constantinopolitan Greek cursive. This difference, uh, this is different in several ways from the manuscript Iliad we just looked at. It's a species of literature that is fundamentally scribal and literate rather than oral. There's oral poetry at the root of it. The speakings, not writings of the Hebrew Navi or oral poet known as Yirmeyahu or Jeremiah, but those speakings are embedded in a book supposedly written by Jeremiah's amanuensis, Baruch ben Nehemiah. What you see here is a Latin book written by Saint Jerome about the book written by Baruch about the prophecies of Jeremiah. It's a book about a book about a book, as so many books are in literary traditions. And of course, it's in Latin, not Greek. It is written in a nice, sober Carolingian hand quite different in spirit from the extravagant Greek hand of Constantinos Laskas. By the way, St. Jerome is known in Latin as Hieronymus Spidonensis because he came from a town called Spido Dalmatiae, which was somewhere in Slovenia or Croatia. No one knows exactly where it was because the town was destroyed in the year 379 by Gothic raiders and destroyed so thoroughly that no one has ever located the ruins, though several archaeologists have tried. So St. Jerome, like Hueso, couldn't go home again. Home isn't there. It's one more lost civilization. The scribe whose work we're looking at allowed himself to have a little fun with the titling, but not too much. Nobody in the scribe's own time and place, if they could read Latin at all, would have any difficulty reading what is written here. And it's no great feat to do a kind of typographic imitation. In hoc codice sunt explanationem in hieroniam hieronimi libri sex, a primo usquim sexto. In this codex are the explanation of Jeremiah by Jerome in six books from the first to the sixth, and some other things. 
But here is another copy of the same work, written a couple of centuries later, and some 500 miles south and west, at the Benedictine Abbey in Moissac, which is southeast of Bordeaux. Here the scribe allowed himself to have a lot more fun, and the titling has become complex. So complex that the scribe himself has provided a gloss above each word or phrase in interwoven capitals at the top of the page. The same word or phrase is written in plain text. The first line isn't difficult to read, nor to approximate in type. But the second and third lines are harder, and the fourth is a lot harder yet. It has twice as many words and twice as many letters as the third line in the same amount of space. When I tried to make a typographic approximation of this, I managed to set only the first half of the fourth line, more or less legibly, and then I ran out of space. <laughs> Renaissance Greek is easy by comparison. So here's my attempt to set in type the entire title. It took me eight lines for the 12th century scribe to do it in six and a quarter. But like him, I succeeded in putting letter forms together in such a way that most readers probably need subtitles to find their way through the text. <laughs> Was I wasting my time? I wouldn't have tried to do this if the early French scribe hadn't goaded me into it, but doing it forced me to look very closely at what he had done and to realize that in some ways the art of this 12th century Christian monk is close to that of the 8th century Buddhist monk Huaisu. Both of them practice a difficult, rarefied craft. Both, it seems to me, are trying to make a page of writing that is an honest picture of the world as they perceive it, a picture of the process and texture of reality. Is it any surprise that that makes writing harder to read? In case you wonder what the fuss is about, here it is again with an English translation, uh, which I suppose if you're sitting in the front row, you might even be able to read. Anyway, it's, 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 it's not journey, it's just a title, uh, basically. It's, it, it, it's a title page and a table of contents combined. But like a chapter head, it fits on half a page, leaving the rest of the page for the text. In the modern world, title page and table of contents are two parts of a book where legibility is, as a rule, very important. Here, legibility is also apparently worth something. Why else would we have subtitles to help us read through the calligraphy? But evidently, what's most important is having fun and showing off and making a calligraphic picture of the world. So in that respect, it isn't like a title page or table of contents as much as like the cover of a modern book. Something to grab your attention, first of all, and only secondarily to give you information. And what should we call these clusters of letters? In typography, we call fused letters ligatures, but that hardly captures what the scribe is doing here. These letter clusters are more like alphabetic chords, chords in the musical sense. In music, the minimal number of elements in a chord is usually three, and the maximum number is whatever you can play. And these letters, clusters, are chords, but what are the governing principles? Are there thirds and fifths and octaves in this alphabet? Tonic and dominant letters? All that remains to be explored. And I'm convinced that it is worth exploring. Typography can't replicate lettering like this, and that's just fine. We still have to ask, what can typography learn from these old manuscripts and inscriptions? And the answer, it seems to me, is quite a lot. Here, and in many examples of Romanesque lettering, the cluster starts gently. Almost anyone can read the first line. And then the density increases. It gets harder and harder, faster and faster. It's like the, the Mountain King theme in Greek's Pure Dent Suite. You know that, that piece? It starts off nice and easy, and it gets faster and faster and faster and faster until the musicians collapse. <laughs> and that's what happens here. 
starts off and the reader collapses in exhaustion if the calligrapher doesn't collapse. <laughs> there's the word libri, books, and the word scripturalum of the scriptures, and the name Hieronymus, Jerome. And if you look closely at the latter, it's my, it's my only, my only part of trick in the film. If you look closely at the, at, the, at the name at the bottom, Hieronymus, and if you're sitting closely enough to see the slide, you'll see that the scribe was having so much fun when he wrote this that he wrote the N-I, Hieronymus, twice. Once inside the R and then again full size, fused with the following M. So we have here, in fact, Hieronymus. It's one of the nicest scribal errors I've ever seen. The typographic masters of the Renaissance, however, Nicolas Johnson and Alice Marouches in Venice and Antonio Viscomini in Florence and Simone Colline and Michel Latrecin and Robert Tien in Paris, they were not interested in this. To them, caps were not for playing games and not for interweaving. Game playing was left to the illuminated. For printers, caps were for making essential declarations. All this published this edition of Cicero in 1514, less than a year before his death. Caps are used here for the title of Aldous's dedication and introduction to the book. And on the other side of the same leaf, caps are used when he tells us the, the famous message that he had posted over his door, a message too serious to risk making it illegible. Quis quis es, whoever you are, Rogate Aldus etiam, atque etiam Aldus asks you over and over, si quides, quod asse veris, if there is anything you want from him, per paucis agas de indi actutum areas, be brief and take your leave. <laughs> In the capitals, the sequence QU, QV, as it's written here, is cast as a ligature because that's an indissoluble pair of letters, a digraph like English or German CH that represents a single speech sound. In the lowercase text, however, there are over a hundred ligatures subtly doing their work, two different typographic cultures working in part. The printers didn't want to play games with those Roman capitals, but some of the Renaissance painters and sculptors did. Many of you must have seen this fresco on the wall of the Duomo in Florence. It's big, it's almost 30 feet high, about 16 feet wide, and made to look like a large tapestry. And if you've seen it, I hope you've looked at the inscription. Andrea del Castagno, who painted this, made a point of putting the inscription where you could read it. Hic quem sublimem in equo pictum cernis Nicolaeus Tomentias est in Titus dux Florentini exerpitus. How, if you were a typographer, could you walk past lettering like this and not feel compelled to try something similar in type metal or in pixels if you lived in a pixelated culture? I'm sorry to keep laboring this theme, but even here in one of the finest pieces of typographic painting or painterly typography to be found anywhere in Europe, in a fresco in a church, we're faced with a reminder that warfare is never far away. This is a monument to a military commander, the defender of the Florence. Human beings can do many wonderful things, but keeping the peace doesn't seem to be one of them. So what are books for in a world where humans are largely obsessed with themselves and consumed by sociopathic visions of power? Books are for literature, and literature is food, intellectual, moral, and spiritual food. Languages are living things. Weightless, intangible epiphytes growing on and within human beings. Every group of human beings, whether it's two or two billion, is host to at least one human language. 
which grows on and in humans, the way mistletoe and moss grow on oak trees, or lichens grow on pines. The relation is symbiotic and it's commensal. We nourish languages and the languages nourish us. They lubricate our lives and they feed us. They're a class of living things. They have their own anatomy as different from ours as ours is from the anatomy of an apple tree or a starfish. And since no one has ever seen a language, because languages are invisible, that anatomy is a little hard to describe. But we all know something about it. We know about the nouns and verbs and particles, the subjects and the predicates, the sentences and phrases. I think myself that languages are more like invisible plants than like invisible animals. Our daily chatter is like their leaves. They breathe through those things, those words we say. And poems and stories are their fruit. Literature is their fruit. It's where the nourishment, the real nourishment lies. Literature for us is a form of nourishment and pleasure like oranges and apples, but for languages, literature is a reproductive strategy like oranges and apples. You may think when you're making a book that you're working for yourself, making art or indulging in the luxury of self-expression, but from the language's point of view, you're working for it, just like squirrels burying, burying fur cones in the forest are working for the trees as much as for themselves. You're keeping the forest of language and culture healthy, helping it grow while others pursuing delusions of their own are doing their best to destroy it. Good luck to you, and thank you. <laughs>